Okay, let's go back. Now, if the miscible liquid uh, pairs that we have, uh, for example, let's say we have the phase diagram uh, for a solvent pair BC and AC, which are partially miscible. So the phases constituting of components BC and AC are partially miscible, but C is completely miscible with B, same thing with C being completely miscible with A. But the corresponding phases are said to be only partially miscible. If that is the case, we don't have this kind of diagram, the first one, this one. This one in here, wherein we have partially miscible components. So it's really A, B, and C, which are partially, partially miscible. Now, in the other type here of triangular diagram, it's the phases constituting of these pairs of components that are partially miscible, not that the components are partially miscible with each other. So we have a different uh, equilibrium diagram for such partially miscible liquid pairs. So we still have this, what we call phase envelope. This is still the two-phase region that separated the two-phase uh, that separated or rather the envelope that separated the two-phase region from the one-phase region here. And like the previous diagram in which we only have one phase region and one two-phase region, in here we have one two-phase region and two one-phase regions in here. So we still have, of course, the pi lines that will signify that this point here and the upper envelope is said to be equilibrated with this point here on the lower uh, face envelope. But nonetheless, these particular equilibrium diagrams are not being used uh, now. Previously it was in our time then, but as two problems that you will be dealing right now in the current time, the kind of diagram that you will be using is this one, the pair of the rectangular and the triangular diagram. Okay, we have discussed this last meeting and how to find the location of the two layers. And of course, after that, you'll be able to determine the compositions. Now, we have this what we call inverse lever arm rule. Uh, that will help us, though the process is really graphical. So if you are comfortable already with the analytical technique and the problem can be solved using pure analytical technique, there's no need for you to use the, the inverse lever arm rule. This allows you to determine any of these phases here. It could be the liquid phase. It could be the, or rather this could be the uh, L is for the um, feed phase. This could be for your solvent phase. And this one is for your bulk phase, M. The back face is actually just the sum of the L and the V. Knowing the two will allow you to determine the other one using the inverse lever arm rule. Um, it's very graphical in the sense that you're going to measure this, the length of this particular portion of this uh, line segment. The same thing with the length in here and the length from this point to this point. If you don't want to do measuring actual measurement of these segments here, you can also refer to this one, the length here, uh, vertical to the entire vertical length here, if we refer to the entire triangle. Or we can also use this one, the horizontal. So we can have this and the entire horizontal base of the bigger triangle. Now, but as I've said, you don't need the, the inverse lever arm rule because this can also be done using simple material balance without you having to rely on measurements. But nonetheless, I will just place here what is meant by the inverse lever arm rule. So for example, uh, you're after or you're after any of these two, let's say uh, you're given the value of the bulk phase M. So this is known and this one is unknown. So when you determine using the inverse lever arm rule, the value of the L, L being in here, there's so many ways of doing it, three different ways. I will just give you one of the three and you can read the rest from John Cook, please. So what you can do is, since this is M here, 
at the bottom and it's known and you want to know L, you have to measure the line segment length from L to V. So this one, L to V. So I'll place here L, V. Naturally, if you are going to use the, the not the not the inverse lever arm rule because it's inverse lever arm rule if it's l that you're going to determine it would be the length from l to m but since it's inverse lever arm rule what you're going to reflect here is uh, m to v so what you'll have here is m v the length of the segment m v but since i have written it here i can also use the tri the triangle uh, horizontal uh, for this particular the base of the triangle I have one big triangle with this base I have one small triangle with this base for the L now if it's this particular horizontal part of the triangle that I'm going to use for M then this LV a substitute for LV here will be your XA or your x sub a minus this x sub a minus y sub a. Why will you take the difference of x sub a minus y sub a? Because it will give you the length of the entire base of this big triangle. Now, if it's L, naturally, uh, what you're going to do is supposed to be, it would be this small triangle that you will consider. So you will get uh, x a minus x a m. That should be this base here. But since it's inverse lever arm rule, instead of using this, you don't use that. This one you will use. Okay, so what you will be placing here on top is XA or X sub AM minus YA. Now you've used the base of the big triangle and the small triangle here. If it's the uh, what you call this the altitude of the triangle it could also be done like this one you want this one used for the m so it would be this entire length i can place here it could be uh, for that denominator it could be x sub c minus y sub c because it will give you this entire altitude of this big triangle now for l it would have been this one but since it's inverse level arm rule it would be this so in the numerator, you'll be placing FCM minus YC. So it would be this one that you're going to place, not this, for your uh, side of the, uh, shall we say, the altitude of the triangle. So that's how you do using inverse lever arm rule. I don't suggest that you use this, but since it's being discussed in the book, I'm just discussing it here as well. So you would know what's inverse lever arm rule. You can also change this. It's for example, if it's V over M, or it could be uh, L over V, the same thing applies. So if it's L over V, it would be the other side, or the other base or the other altitude of the uh, triangle that you're going to place here for L and V, the small triangle. So we're talking about small triangles this time because we don't have the M. In here we have M. So you have one big triangle and you have one small triangle. So if you have your copies of John Koo, please, you can read more on this topic of the inverse lever arm rule. It's a substitute for uh, analytically determining the values of the streams given the two. It requires that you know the other two for you to know the third one, which could be done, of course, using material balance. Okay, that's for inverse lever arm rule. Now, here we have a sample problem, but I will not be using inverse lever arm rule, but rather will be using pure material balance. So you are given that the composition of the two layers that were formed from sample problem number one is uh, 0 0.04 for A and 0 0.02 for B and 0.94 for C for your extract layer. And for the raffinate layer, you have uh, 0.12 for A, 0.86 for B, and 0 0.02 for C. The original mixture contains 100 kilograms or is uh, having the mass of 100 kilograms and has A being equal to 0.10. So you are to determine the amounts of B and L. 
which could be actually solved right away using uh, material and uh, overall material balance and component balance. Let me just uh, take a picture of this so that I will not have to go back to this uh, slide. Okay, so if we go to our whiteboard for this one, so this is our sample problem number two. So you're given, you're given information for number two is that your extract, so that's the V, by the way, V is the extract, raffinate is L. So your extract has these compositions. So YA is 0 0.04. You only need two, the important two. So you don't need water actually. You only need the A and the solvent on it. So I'd like to use the C. Anyway, you would know what's there, that of water. So this one, if you know this two, that's 0 0.98. So automatically your water would be 0 0.02. For your raffinate, it's represented by L. So extract for V, um, raffinate for L. Uh, representation for this is X. So you have XA, XC, and XB. So based on what's provided in the problem, your XA is 0.12 here. Your XC is 0 0.02. And your XB is 0.86. The reason why we call the raffinate layer as the water-rich layer because it has, in terms of composition, it has the most part water. In the case of the extract layer, we call it the solvent-rich layer because it has more of the C, the, the extractor of the A from the feed. So this is extract and this is raffinate. And these are the information given in the problem. Now the problem asks you, with starting with the feed, the original mixture being equal to 100 with an XAM. So meaning this F is also your M. That's your bulk phase where these two came from after equilibrated. So you have this one for 0.10. And you are asked to determine the V and L. I think you know how it's this to be done. So with material balance, if this is the bulk phase where this two is coming from, so when you do overall material balance, your V plus L must be equal to 100. So this is your first equation. If you do component balance on A, so you have to use the A values here. So you have VYA plus LXA is equal to M or the FXAM. Now, if you substitute, so you have VYA is 0 0.04 and your L, if you get it from here, will be 100 minus B. Then the XA that you have here is 0.12. Your M, the back phase, is 100 with 10% of it being A. You can write away solve for the V. And when you solve the V, you can also get the L. So a very simple problem on material balance uh, applied on extraction. So we have actually a process of a simple equilibration of the extract and the raffinate layer coming from the back phase that was processed or that's your feed. Okay, so we go back to our slide. Why did I close that one? Now we continue. So that's for sample problem number three. Now we also have what we call multi-stage leaching. So it's actually just a one leaching equipment placed side by side or one on top of the other, making it one uh, cascade of several units. So. For a single stage liquid liquid extraction process, so this is what this one is just for one box. Your LO is the feed, your V2 is your solvent. 
just like what I've said a while ago that D is also solvent and L is feed. Now, if we are going to use V and L for the two product phases, then V is the extract and L is the raffinate. So these two are said to be equilibrated. So if you're going to perform material balance, very simple, you add the two phases entering the single stage unit, and then you also add the two phases, equilibrated phases that is leaving the unit. And the sum of these two streams would be your bulk phase M. You can make one, uh, component balance, it's suggested that you make a component balance on the solute, the component of interest that is to be transferred from the feed to the solvent carried out in here in the extract. Now this one was presented as well that in terms of composition of the three components in our phases, the sum should be, so of it should be equal to one. So it's the same thing with the Y. So you just pair the L with X and you pair the B with Y and correspondingly label the streams. Now, for a single stage unit, so you have the representation here, if it's plotted on the triangular equilibrium diagram and if your LO, the feed, does not contain any solvent C, you see this is your solvent C, and B, as I have mentioned, is most of the time water, and this is your solute A. So it's right on the horizontal axis. That's your LO. Your solvent is most of the time also, your solvent is most of the time pure. If not pure, then it will be also mentioned in the problem or specified. So if it's a 100% solvent, C, then it would be right on the tip of this triangular diagram. Now the bulk phase M is somewhere here in the middle. So how do you locate the bulk phase M? You use material balance or you use the inverse lever arm rule. So if you know where is this and you know where is this, you would know the length of this or you would know the altitude of this triangle against this entire big triangle or you consider this one against the entire, depends on what process of inverse lever arm rule you will use. But if you don't want use it, to use inverse lever arm rule, you can use just material balance. You'll be able to get the M. Now, how will you locate the, the phases, the product phases, the extract and the raffinate phases? So just like what I have also mentioned in the first part of this set of slides, you will have to look for points in here in the lower part of your, for a point on the lower part of your face envelope, which you will have to connect to a point on the upper part of your face envelope that will ride through, pass through this M. But these two points are not just randomly selected, but they are equilibrated. So this triangular diagram is paired with the rectangular diagram here which will tell you that if you start with V1, what would be the corresponding L1 for that? Or if you start with L1, what would be the corresponding V1 for that? Then connect the two points. If it passes to M, then these are your equilibrated product phases, extract and raffinate. If not, then you have to try again. Good if the problem gives you already uh, either of the concentration of these two. So if a problem gives you the concentration of the raffinate using equilibrium on the lower part here of the rectangular diagram, you can uh, locate your extract on the upper part of the face envelope based on the procedure also discussed. Then that's it. It would not be something trial and error. But if both are not known, then you have to resort to trial and error. Now I have here a sample problem uh, that will illustrate the procedure. So I'm really emphasizing it's all about a procedure. There's nothing to analyze actually with unit operations. It's just mostly uh, procedures, graphs, formulas that you know how to use and you know where to get the data of. So in this case, uh, this problem will illustrate the use of this procedure that I have discussed a while ago. So let's read the problem. You're given here a feed mixture weighing 200 kilograms of unknown composition, but we know that it's containing water, acetic acid, and isopropyl ether. 
It's contacted in a single stage with 280 kilograms of mixture containing 40% acetic acid, 10% water, and 50 weight percent isopropyl ether. The resulting raffinate layer weighs 320 kilograms and contains 29.5 weight percent acetic acid, 66.5 weight percent water, and 4 weight percent isopropyl ether. So you are to determine the original composition of the feed mixture and the composition of the resulting extract layer. So I'm taking a picture so I won't have to go back to this slide. So we go to the whiteboard and write down the informations that were provided for us. So this is for number three. So if you draw here a rectangle representing a single stage extraction unit so this is your LO. This must be your V2. This must be your L1. And this is your V1. So the feed is mentioned to be 200 kilograms of acetic acid, water, and ether. We do not know the composition, but it's 200 kilograms. And it is contacted with a... 280 kilogram mixture. So your solvent is a 280 kilogram mixture consisting of 40% uh, acetic acid. So I'd like here to write 0.4, 10% um, water. By the way, it should not be X because we're, we're, we're talking about solvent. So this should be Y class, Y. Now I get dirty, so we'll, it should be white. So this is YA, YB, and since this is the solvent, so our remaining part will be your isopropyl ether, the solvent. Oh. Wait. The resulting raffinate layer weighs 320 kilograms. So this is 320 kilograms. And uh, it has 29.5, so XA1, 0.295 acetic acid, 66.5 water. So XB1 is 0.665 water. The remaining is isopropyl ether. So XC1 is 4%. So this would be 0 0.04. Okay. Now we are after this one. So the problem is asking you to determine the original composition of the feed. So it's after XAO, XCO, and XBO. And it's also after the composition of the resulting extract layer. So it's asking for YA1, YB1, and YC1. Okay, so what you're going to do, you're going to use the equilibrium diagram, the pair of the rectangular and triangular equilibrium diagram. And by the way, I'll be uploading in Canvas the diagram that we will all be using so that it will be uniform. So you will have to uh, prepare such diagram for the quiz. So that way, we will have the same size of diagram that we will read on the information during the quiz or during the exam or if the need arise for us to use such. Okay. Now I'll go to the, so the third part here. So we go to... What did I? So you have the solution. Okay.
when you use material balance for this, so your overall material balance, it would be your LO plus V2 equated to V1 plus L1, which will constitute the bulk phase M. LO, V2, V1, L1, which will be your bulk phase M. So all you have to do is add 200 and 280. So you have 200 here and 280 here. V1 is unknown, but we know that the raffinate is 320. So here we get that the bulk phase is 480 kilograms. And your V1 is, though it's not being asked in the problem, you have, so this is 480 minus 320, so that would be 160. So please check my values. So you have already the M and the V1. When you use component balance on A, so you have LOXAO plus V2YA2, is equal to V1, YA1, plus L1, X, X, A1. Your LO, you know to be 200, but you do not know XAO. Your V2 is 280 with a YA2. Your YA2, this one is 0.4. Now this one you do not know, uh, you know already to be 160, but your YA1 is unknown. So you place here YA1, your L1 is 320 with an XA1 that is provided in the problem, 0.295. So the only way that you'll be able to solve for XAO, the A, the composition of the feed in terms of A, you need to know YA1. Okay, how do you determine YA1? So let's go back to our... So this is our presentation and we have here this one, okay? Now you have to locate the raffinate part, which is being mentioned here. So it says that your raffinate is 29.5%. Let me go back to the picture that I have taken. It's 29.5 acetic acid and 4% isopropyl ether. So it's 4% isopropyl ether, 29.5. It's almost like 30 acetic acid. So your raffinate is almost 30 acetic acids. If this is 0 0.5, you have 0 0.10, 0 0.20, 0 0.30. So it's somewhere here. Somewhere here, but not really 30, so somewhere here. That's your raffinate, okay? It's like 4%, more or less 4%. If this is 0.10, so 4% isopropyl ether is somewhere here, right? A little bit short of being halfway from this line from zero. So that's the raffinate. So this is actually the location of L1. To find the extra, you follow the procedure that was discussed on how to find or how to establish this tie line here. So what you do, you go down until you reach the end, the curve. This one, you go down until you reach the line because you started with, you started rather from the extract. In here, you started from the raffinate. You turn left until you end with the 45 degree line. So the procedure is opposite that one. And you go up until you're here on the extract. So you have to end right on the, so I will just more or less approximate this distance here. So it's somewhere here. So this is where your V1 is. 
the extract. So you located the extract based on the given information on the raffinate. So from here, you can see that more or less your YA1, your YA1 is, uh, if this is 0.10, so around 0.12. This is 0.12 and your C, your C here is 6, 7, 8, so 8, 5 more or less. So Y, C1 is more or less 0.85. So it's an approximation based on my location of the points here. And then you use the values that you have. So take note for A, we have 0.12 and for C, we have 0.85. So we go back to what we're solving. And since you know this already, then you will be able to get XAO. So you have here 160 times 0.12. And the rest we just copy. You have 280 here times 0.4 plus 200 times XAO. So you already have XAO. You'll be getting a value for XAO. You do the same for the C. You just change the A's here. You have here to C. Then this, the, your unknown here will be XCO. Now, you know A and you know C, the B will just follow. So in terms of what is required, you already determine the composition of the feed. And for the extract, what I took is just A and C. So you just subtract the sum of the two from one, that would be your B. In our case, uh, this one is more or less 0.12. This one is more or less 0.85. So that's 0.97. So this is more or less 0 0.03. For the, a, for the composition of the feed, you have to finish this one. But anyway, it's just very simple. For C, you do the same. You just change the A here. You use component C to balance. Uh, it's the C rather component that you need to balance. So this is our uh, extraction problem for a single stage unit. Any questions so far? Okay, none. So let's proceed. We go to the next part here. Now let's go to the types of the extraction equipment and the design for such equipments. So if you recall, gas absorption is designed based on the flooding velocity. So it's the same thing actually with liquid-liquid extraction. You only need to use a different correlation diagram. So for an extraction equipment, we have the simplest in the form of mixer settlers. Uh, in, the, in A, you have a separate mixer and a settler here. In here, your feed is homogenized, and then in here, they are being separated. Extract being removed uh, on the top and roughing it in here. This one, uh, you have it in one equipment, the mixer and uh, the part wherein they are equilibrated and eventually separated. So you have the extract being removed from the top of the unit and the roughing it at the bottom. There could also be other systems as uh, complex as this or as detailed as this, wherein you have baffles that guide the, the separation, the separation of the emulsion. You know, emulsions, they are very difficult to separate the emulsions from the heavy and the lighter part uh, constituting your product phases. Now you have the heavy uh, liquid here being removed at the bottom part and the lighter liquid on top. So this is the interface here. But still you have the mixer here and this actually is comparable to the separate separator. Separator for your product phases, extract and raffinate. But most of the extraction units that are used are in the form of vertical columns. Uh, in here, what you have is a spray extraction tower. The heavy liquid most of the time class is the feed and the lighter liquid is the solvent. 
So in this case, your solvent is bubbled up, dispersed against the heavy liquid, the feed that is flowing down. So the heavy liquid outlet is, the, of course, the bottom part of the tower. The light liquid outlet is the top of the tower. We have uh, spray towers, extraction towers. We even have pack towers also. Um, pack extraction towers. So it could be in this form or it could be in this form here. So your uh, lighter component is introduced from the top and it's being sprayed against the, the component that flows upward. So the flow is still counter current. When do we use the spray extraction tower? So this is used when there is a rapid irreversible chemical reaction occurring in the process of separation, such as neutralization of waste acids. So this is a column that has only one or two stages and it is, uh, shall we say, inexpensive, but it's inexpensive, but rarely used, the spray type extraction tower. As for the packed extraction towers, for most of you who have probably read on and advanced, this is uh, much way accurate than the spray tower. So more efficient than the spray tower, used when only a few stages is needed, and when interfacial tension is just around 10 dyne per centimeters. There are uh, phases which we need to separate later on whose or which has interfacial tension greater than even 25 dyne per centimeter. For such, the extraction tower design is modified. That way, the problem with a very high interfacial tension is addressed. And that would be presented at the latter part of this slide. So the choice of packing material for pack towers is based on the continuous phase. So the continuous phase is actually the feed. Okay, Most of the time, it is the feed. Uh, unless otherwise the problem specifies that the continuous phase is the solvent. Now, usually what is preferred here is the random packing over the structured packing materials. And we're using here, if in gas absorption, we're using the concept of HETP. In extraction towers, we use the concept of HETS, uh, which stands for height equivalent to a theoretical stage. Uh, in, ga in gas absorption, we call it height equivalent to a theoretical plate. That is why it's referred to as HETP. Um, in the case of back extraction towers, they have HETS greater than mechanically agitated towers. So you already know that part of uh, the modification and the design of extraction tower is in the agitation. So meaning you don't just have a tower as simple as this, which has sprays or this one, which has nozzles at the bottom that disperses the solvent against the liquid that is flowing down. But there is some form of agitation uh, right in the tower itself, or even uh, in some, there is some degree of vibrations provided that will enhance, of course, mass transfer. Now, the basis for designing the extraction tower is also flooding. So this occurs when increasing either the flow rate of the dispersed or continuous phase makes both of the phases to leave the continuous phase outlet. The continuous phase outlet is leaving the bottom of the tower and we know that flooding occurs if all your phases, the continuous phase and the dispersed phase uh, is, uh, shall we say, leaving the bottom part of the tower, meaning your solvent is supposed to flow counter current against your continuous phase, which is your feed, is not anymore leaving the top of the tower. It's leaving the bottom of the tower because your tower is already flooded. When is such condition when the, we say that the tower is already flooded? So when flow rates of these two, either of the two, is already beyond the tolerable amount. So then the tower is said to be experiencing flooding. It is recommended that the design flow rates be set at 50% of the flooding condition based on the flooding correlation. So there's a flooding correlation diagram that we'll be using. And it has also an equivalent in your handbook. 
the flooding correlation diagram, which uh, looks similar to the flooding correlation diagram for gas absorption. It's the same thing, only that we have a different set of uh, parameters to multiply to each other. That way we will have either the abscissa or the ordinate of such uh, diagram. So if you recall again, so just for review, when we speak of gas absorption, when we design our tower, gas absorption tower, or it could be the sleeping tower, it's not 50%, but rather 60% of the flooding velocity. So we will say that uh, extraction is a little bit conservative compared to uh, gas absorption and stripping in terms of this requirement. So only 50% of the flooding velocity is used as the basis for designing the column. So as for the flooding correlation diagram, so this is from adapted from Crawford and Wick, Wilkie. Uh, I'm not sure if it's pronounced properly. This is taken from Jan Kuplis. It has an equivalent in your handbook. Now in here, there's a need for you to find the value of uh, the vertical axis, this one, so that you will be getting uh, any of these two. So I actually you'll be getting a ratio of these two that would lead to eventually finding the values of the two, which refers to the flow rate of the continuous and the dispersed phases in here. So before you can have this, you need to determine this one, which of course will just be using the correct property tables. So you have the sigma, the interfacial tension, the UC, the density of the continuous phase. So the ratio of the two will be raised to 0.2 multiplied to the viscosity of the continuous phase divided by the difference in the density of the continuous phase and the dispersed phase multiplied to interfacial tension. I don't know. Now A, it's a parameter that will be taken from a, uh, so this is something to do with surface area per unit volume, if I'm, not, if I'm not mistaken. And this one, the epsilon is the void. So if in kinetics, it refer, it's representing voids, the epsilon here is also representing the void fraction specifically. Now we get this too from a table. So the table will be shown to you in a little while. If you have this computed, all you have to do is find the value here and then project it on the right until you reach the curve, then read the corresponding uh, X coordinate, which will help you determine the ratio of the continuous and dispersed phase flow rates. Given the actual flow rates in the problem, you'll be able to determine, so you have this as one equation equated to the value that you are getting here. So what will be left is the VC and VD because you, of course, will substitute the, the, the raw, the mu, and the A here. So you have two unknowns, the V sub C and the V sub D. Now, based on what the problem gives as to the actual flow rates, then you can have now uh, two equations with two unknown. Uh, yeah, one equation with one unknown because you will actually based on the actual given in the problem information and the problem you will substitute here. So two equations with two unknowns will lead you to do two unknowns, which is this one. Once you have already the flow rates, that's the one that you're going to use in determining how big is the column or something to do with the diameter of the column, which will eventually also lead to the uh, height of the column based on the other information given in the problem, okay? The table that I was referring to is this one. So this is for pack extraction tower, and this is for uh, the characteristics like uh, the void fraction epsilon and the A, where is the A? Surface area per cubic feet. So I mentioned it's something to do with area with per unit volume. So this two is taken from this table. And by the way, this table has an equivalent also in section two of your handbook. I've checked it already. It's even more comprehensive. The, the, of course, the packing materials, there's so many there. You just have to look for the right pack, uh, the packing material that is specified in the problem. So in here, we only have this small group for the random packing and we have this small group for the structured packing. 
in the handbook, there are several pages for just the random packing and we have several pages for the structured packing. And then you have to look for the corresponding epsilon and A in here. Okay, so the ones that are not uh, in the parentheses are the English units and in the parentheses you have the SI unit. So you need this table for these two, which will be used in computing the Y coordinate uh, to be used here in the flooding correlation diagram. Now, another table that you will use is uh, the performance parameters for extraction tower table, table 12.6-1. This is actually just a table for validation. You validate whether after you have computed for the VC and the VD, uh, V sub D, using the correlation diagram, this one, and the actual data given in the problem, whether the value that you got for that particular tower that's specified in the problem, so if it's a spray tower, this should be the range of the combined streams VD and VC. Uh, what do you mean, Miss, with the combined stream? So if you have already, let's say, computed for the condition when the tower is already flooded, it's already flooded, you are to multiply it to 50%. So for both the VC and the VD, then the values that are 50% of the flooding condition will be added and averaged, or simply put, they will be averaged. You take the sum of the two uh, values for VC and VD, which is just 50% of the computed <laughs> and get their average. Okay, the average should fall within the range that is specified in here. So if it's a spray tower, it should not be lower than 15. It should not exceed 75. If it's a structured parking tower, same thing. So this will validate whether what you are doing is correct or uh, whether in terms of design, your tower is, will be working or not. Now, in terms of the height, because we also determine the height of the column and aside from the diameter of the column, you'll be using this. The height equivalent uh, the height of equilibrium stage or HETS. And for spray tower, what we do is we take the sum of the lower and upper values in the range and divide it by two. This HETS, we multiply with the theoretical number of stages, either required in the problem or already specified in the problem for us to be able to determine how high will be our column. Okay, so in this table, you'll be able now to validate whether the value that you got for the diameter is acceptable because you're using the same VC and VD for the diameter of the column and you're using the last column for the height of the tower. Okay, there's a uh, problem that I'll be discussing um, on Wednesday on how to use these tables together with the diagram. And that problem will be this and there will be a required assignment uh, in relation to this one, but that will be given to you on Wednesday, okay? So it's already like 4.20 something, it's almost like time. So we will discuss the solution of this on Wednesday. So asynchronous for this week. We will, uh, we're trying to finish the things that we are lagging behind that way. Uh, come end term, we will be discussing topics in end term. We will not have to holding our breath so that we will finish everything. Okay. Any question, class? I'll stop sharing. Any question? Okay. If there are no questions, then let's call it a day. This has been a four long hour of lecture for me. So uh, hopefully you've learned something new this afternoon. Uh, thank you for listening, class. We'll hear each other again on Wednesday. Bye for now. <clears throat> Excuse me. Thank you, Miss. Bye. Thank you, Miss. Okay, bye. Thank you, Miss.